tuning in. Today I have a very special guest today. Uh, he is a chiropractor and director of the Hamilton Back Clinic. Uh, he was nominated for the Best Chiropractor of the Year in 2013. Uh, in, the pa- in the past 14 years, he's seen over 103,000 patients and published over 125 articles. He's also a consultant for the uh, National Lacrosse League, National World Cycle Championships. Uh, he's treated people from the NFL, NHL, National Canadian Football League. Um, he's treated in Budapest and Finland. Uh, and he's been getting some, I've been really getting some interesting results from uh, his work. Uh, he's the creator of the x system, which focuses on dysfunction rather than, you know, treating the points. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Andy Lombardi. Thank you very much for being here, doctor. Thank you for having me, Bob. I really, I really do appreciate it. It's an honor. Um, it's yeah. I really don't know where to start. You've just done so much stuff. Like how, how did this journey begin for you? Because you've done chiro, you've done kinesiology, you've done medical acupuncture. Where, where did this journey start? How were you inspired? Well, that, that, that's a good question. I um, when I left uh, the kinesiology program uh, at McMaster University, I went to New York Chiropractic College. And uh, from there, to be honest, I just thought I was going to be a regular chiropractor, whatever that means, you know. But at that time, I just wanted to finish and 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 go from there. And and what happens as you progress? In my last year, uh, I met uh, a mentor who became a mentor of mine, Doctor Alejandro Ilarega, uh, well known in the the medical acupuncture uh, field. And he teaches still uh, medical acupuncture, contemporary medical acupuncture at McMaster University. And he came in uh, to the uh, in Buffalo where I was doing my internship, and he gave a presentation. And I happened to be the guest patient or volunteer to be the oh, guest really? patient. Okay. I had a shoulder problem at the time, and I'd never had acupuncture before. And he, his model is similar to what a lot of people now that practice electroacupuncture is a neurofunctional approach where. They don't just uh, the reason there's a, a method to the madness and where they put the needle and why based on restoring uh, activation of uh, of muscles and nerve stimulation and so on and so forth. So he did that. And within one visit, my strength, not only was my shoulder better, but it was stronger than it was before I was injured. And so that to me said, uh, I really have to look into this. And so when I graduated, I took his course. And uh, thankfully, his course, McMaster University, is in Hamilton, Ontario, where I practice, where, where I'm from. And so I continually took all of his courses. And, and I believe at the time you had to take nine or ten courses or, or take four or five courses two or three times. It's something like that. Because he was my mentor and I was so focused on it, I just did whatever I needed to do and I became an instructor. And from there, you know, the passion just ignited because – what happens at the same time, of course, I was treating patients. I, was, I started my practice in 2003. And when you start getting results that are uncommon, that uh, that other therapists aren't getting, and then patients are like, wow, I've never had this before. This is great. You get excited about that, and you want to continually learn. So I stayed at McMaster from 2004 to 2013. And uh, at that point, uh, I left. And at that, it was around the same time I started uh, that x the x assessment system yeah. and my motor point manuals and the, the videos uh, started to take off. And so um, that really was where the passion started. And, of course, every day when I go to work, there is still to this day, knock on wood, there's not one day where I say, oh, geez, I, I, I wish I didn't have to go to work today. Yeah. Every day is exciting. Every day is a challenge, and I'm, and I'm happy about it. And so I think passion has a lot to do with it. And if you can have that passion, then then you're more than halfway there. It's it's yeah. And it's hard to teach or ignite passion. I can't teach you passion. I can teach you different ways to assess or treat. But if you don't have the passion to help people or if someone doesn't have the ha- passion to help people, then it's, you know, it, it's, it's difficult. But the thing is, the majority of people that watch, for example, your podcasts or are involved in, let's say, uh, social media groups with their discussion and cha- discussing and changing, uh, ex- exchanging ideas, those people have the passion because the people that don't, they're not on those groups. They're doing whatever else. And so this is what I think this niche of people that are watching podcasts and trying to improve themselves, they're there because they want to get better. So that's right. kind of exciting for me. Um, because you know that's what we want. We want to have common, you know, common people with common ideas to 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 reach an uncommon goal, which is outstanding clinical results. 
traditional, to be honest, um, I think it was very hit or miss. Um, just the anatomy knowledge just isn't there, to be 100% honest. It's basically more meridians, and this approach is more medical acupuncture. Uh, how would you how would you define medical acupuncture? Because there's so much. Um, there's so much stuff around it because there's motor points and then there's trigger points and then in Chinese medicine there's ashi points. What would you what would you say the differences are, or similarities? I, I would, yeah, we can co- cover both. I think yeah. the differences between medical acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine is that traditional Chinese medicine is more philosophically based, right. and medical acupuncture is more anatomically based. <clears throat> um, even so, phil- uh, the philosophical uh, the traditional Chinese approach has science behind it, but like you said, a lot of the practitioners may not be fully uh, aware of what the anatomy is and why they're doing it. So that, on a surface level, that's the difference uh, there. And in general, with medical acupuncture, we're using less number of acupuncture points versus the traditional uh, approach because we're going directly, let's say we're trying to stimulate the radial nerve, but we only need one or two needles to do yeah. that if we're treating a, a tricep strain or radial nerve palsy uh, versus uh, traditional Chinese medicine will use considerably more covering the meridians that surround the the problem. Yeah, yeah, I've seen yeah I've seen one video where uh, I think it was lower back and rather than just going for the ashi point right away, you, you you tested the obliques and then you tested the glutes and then rather than needle, oh, okay, just you know it's it's like you said it's it's always tempting just to needle wherever it hurts, but that's probably not the root of the problem. So you assess the glutes and other things as as well so yeah oh, i'm sorry go ahead no but i was gonna say exactly uh, many times it's very tempting to treat the area of pain but in reality that is treating the consequence and not the cause so if we can look at the cause we can see functionally uh, what isn't working and this is where the x system and functional assessment comes in where we look at let's try to correct mechanically what isn't working rather than Focusing on the symptom that this the lack of mechanics is is demonstrating. Mm. So so you put out a, an acupuncture motor point manual as well. How, where did the idea come from? That like is it? Uh, and you, you kind of noticed the diff, you, you mentioned the differences between as well. Like rather than a tun in Chinese medicine, you use an inch. So uh, where did that idea come from? So the idea came from standardizing everything because. The as we were taught, the the, the kun c u n yeah. was is based on the width of the patient's thumb. So it's not yeah. standardized because every kun is going to be different based on the patient. So how could I take this measurement and standardize it so then when I'm doing a motor point, I could I could explain to you or explain to anyone from anywhere in the world this is where you find the motor point and this is why. Turns out that the kun actually has a as I said, has a uh, unit of measure associated with it, and it's uh, 1.3 inches. And so it actually has a unit of measurement. And so basically what that is, is essentially at some point, someone did some research where they probably measured uh, a sample size pretty large of everyone's thumb and said, okay, we're going to we're going to make it 1.3 inches. Now, how accurate is that? Well, we don't really know, but that's where we're going. And officially, that's what that is. So what I did was, uh, through my experience, through, um, through, through teaching and practicing myself, I, you know, in general, the motor points are in the belly of a muscle, okay? They're not at the musculotendinous junction. They're not at the, at the attachment points. They're at the, the belly of the muscle. And there's some motor points that are well-known and others that aren't as well-known. So from my experience and from other sources, I consulted uh, from some uh, journal articles back in the 1970s, which I – uh, site in my uh, in my work, um, I said, how are we going to standardize this so everyone in in the world really could understand this is what we're going for, and so that's what I did. I converted all of the qualitative Kuhn's uh, measurements to inches, and some of them was based on my experiences when I was practicing putting this manual together. The each motor point you see. I had to have achieved that motor point nine out of ten times. So ninety percent of the time, I'm able to follow the directions and stimulate the mm. motor point. If I'm not able to do it nine out of ten times, I have to look at a better way to get to stimulate that motor point. And there's a few in there that I had to uh, re-engineer or, or rewrite or even take out of the of the manual because they weren't ninety percent effective. I want everyone to be able be able to do this. The common question that I get is how can 
for instance, if we say the long head of the tricep is find the posterior axial fold, go one inch lateral and two and a half inches distal. If you have someone who's six foot five and 300 yeah. pounds versus yeah. a woman who's five foot 80 pounds, how can you still use that measurement? And, and it's easy because one, these are qualitative measurements I'm giving you. So they're not, and they're qualitative measurements because acupuncture isn't point specific, it's region specific. Right. So what happens is, if you notice in the videos, when I insert the needle, I use the pointer plus, which is a, right. you know, stimulating, which we'll probably talk about. Yeah. But I use my non-dominant hand. And my non-dominant hand, what it does, it, it uh, takes out the tissue pull. It takes out the, the slack in the, the tissue so that the electrons go directly into the, that region, into the motor point, and depolarize that nerve. So it may, the motor point may not be the same in two people, but they're in the same region as all people. And by using the technique, using the pointer plus and the non-dominant hand, you will get the motor point stimulation more than 90% of the time. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of pointer plus, yeah, that was my, actually my next question. It's, um, I think a couple of people have asked about it as well. What is the difference between the pointer plus and just the regular electro uh, machines that you use in your video? Because I noticed you use the, the small, was that a Japanese model or um, electro machine versus the pointer plus? Like what would, what's the main difference? Yeah, to my knowledge, there it's a Japanese model that okay. made in Japan. So, so the the Pointer Plus is a handheld unit. There's a, Pointer Plus is the, the name of it. There's the Pointer Plus and the Pointer Plus XL and the Pointer Plus XL Two. I use the Pointer Plus, which is the original. In my opinion, it's the best okay. because it's smaller. It can fit into your pocket when you go from room to room. Uh, the other ones are bulkier, and these ones have a crisper. Um, uh, conductivity there's not a lot of feedback like the other ones I've experienced have feedback and that is at 10 Hertz so that mm -hmm. stimulates the muscle at 10 Hertz and that's optimal to reactivate motor inhibition so muscle that gets shut off due to injury or due to pain or to do degenerative arthritis we I hit the motor point I stimulate it with the pointer plus at 10 Hertz that's the mechanical treatment so I use the other stim, stim units. There's two I use. One is called the uh, Edo ITO 1107, and the other one I have is the ES 130. They're both very similar units. Mm. They have minor differences, but they they both can stimulate low frequency up to high frequency, um, and I use them with the the alligator clips. And I use them on subsequent treatments to stimulate the muscle at typically lower intensity or for longer periods of time because. With the pointer plus, I'm I'm stimulating for 10, 15 seconds max. Yep. Um, so that's that's the difference in, in that realm. And the the other question is, well, how is that different than using the electric stim or the tens, right. the discs? Yep. The difference is, the electric stim and the tens works from the outside in, the skin, and it's projecting the electrons inward. And the electroacupuncture works from the inside out because it's clipped to the needle that's inside the muscle. Uh. The other differences that you're going to get when you're inside the muscle and you're stimulating it, you're stimulating deeper type 2, type 3 muscle spindles, which you're not doing when you're stimulating with the TENS unit or the electric stim. You're getting stimulation, but not at that uh, molecular level. So there's a, there's a difference there, and there's, you get better results and arguably more of a uh, encephalin endorphin release because you're working from the inside out versus from the outside in. Okay. Okay. That's that's very interesting. So you're saying pretty much different, the pointer plus and the electro they stimulate different layers pretty much. So you're getting covering all your bases. The uh, the the pointer plus uh, so no the pointer plus and the electro stim will will stimulate the this the, the can, can penetrate the same layers, but the electric stim like the Edo and mm. the ES one thirty they will be able to penetrate deeper layers versus when I say electric stim, like like the discs, you know, they put on the, the transcutaneous discs uh, or the TENS unit, different from that. Yeah. How, so how do you explain that in the simplest terms to your patients or they don't really care, they just want to get better? I, just what I said now, no. Oh, okay. I, I, get, I get questions a lot. And yeah. they understand when I tell them that we're stimulating from the inside out versus the yeah. outside in, right. that usually says, oh, that makes sense because right. the problem's on the inside. And so we get to stimulate, you know, the electricity goes directly inside versus here, the electricity starts outside. And of course, it diffuses by the time it gets on the inside. It doesn't, it can't get deeper than yeah. an acupuncture needle with a, with a clip on it. Right. There's no way. There's no way. Oh, okay. Um, could you talk about the x system? Like, what it is, how you came up with it, how it came into evolution. 
That's a great question. So uh, the extra assessment system is a system uh, I created, and I created essentially where I do the same approach, functional approach, to uh, treat musculoskeletal injuries by going through a system of muscle tests specifically focused on the upper and the lower extremity. So extor itself is two words. It's a hybrid word put together. It's examine and restore. So it's exam, you know, the EX from examine and the, the uh-huh. store from restore is, is extor. And what it is is 95% of the time when people come in, they, they come in with injuries, let's say back pain, The hundred almost 100% of the practitioners go and they needle the back pain. What I do is I do what's called a lower extremity scan. There's an upper extremity scan or lower extremity scan. And within two minutes, I'm able to tell what muscles are working and which muscles aren't. And so essentially the scan is testing the hip flexors, abductors, adductors, and hip extensors. And somewhere there's going to be a disconnect. And why we do that, because we're sta- we're testing the muscles that stabilize the pelvic girdle and the spine. In the upper extremity, we're testing muscles of the shoulder. So someone can come in with a neck problem or an elbow problem, and I'm st- and I'm testing the same muscles that stabilize the pelvic, the, the scapular girdle and the spine. So many times, 95% of the time, you find muscles that are shut off. So let's say someone had left low back pain, and I found on the right side the gluteus maximus was inhibited, and on the left side the gluteus minimus was inhibited. I would stimulate those points, motor points, with the pointer plus incorporate the the edo stim the electric stim and that restores the muscle when these muscles are weak they're actually shut off it's called inhibited and three things cause muscles to shut off pain trauma or changes in the joint so mm-hmm. pain low back pain can actually cause surrounding muscles to shut off become inhibited so if you have low back pain it can cause the gluteus maximus to become inhibited, the obliques to become inhibited. Trauma, let's say you're playing hockey or rugby and you get tackled on your onto your shoulder. That impact will cause the muscles that stabilize the shoulder blade to shut off, the serratus anterior, um, uh, the deltoid that stabilizes the glenohumeral joint. And changes in the joint. In older people, when I mean older people, like 50, not that 50 is old, but 50, 60, where arthritic changes in the joints start to take place, muscles shut off without them even knowing it. And so that's why a lot of times people come in with knee pain and they'll go to the orthopedist and they'll see they have arthritic changes and they may even be a candidate for surgery, but they'll come in and we activate the muscles that are shut off and they never have to have surgery the rest of their lives, many of them. So the extra system is good because it's easy to learn. The system, it takes two minutes and mm-hmm. then the uh, the therapist, the acupuncturist, chiropractor, physical therapist can go right to the area of dysfunction, restart it, and the, here's the most important part: the patient sees ex- uh, sees dramatic results right away. Because what happens, they'll be uh, have tested and say their gluteus maximus is weak, and then at the end of the visit, they're like, "Oh wow, what a difference!" And they see the difference, yeah. and they see the objective yeah. difference, and they appreciate it, and you've won them over right. uh, from a even a business standpoint. Yep. They're going to go and tell their friends, you know, on the first visit, I saw significant measurable changes. And that's a problem in many professions yep. where, you know, they'll say, you know, all right, six or seven visits. No, but if you, you'll you see changes in one or two visits, if you give them changes, they're going to tell many people and the other people are going to tell many people and so on and so forth. And so for me, what the system's done is I now see an average of 12 new patients a week. So to put right. that in perspective, in North America, the average chiropractor sees 4.3 new patients a week, and I've been seeing 12 new patients a week since 2011. So it's very busy, and I'm happy to help people. And of course, they get better faster, and it it helps in 95% of the cases because 95% of the cases are mechanical in nature. They're yeah. not uh, like neuropathies or, or chronic pain or, or things of that nature. So that's kind of the you know the story that's, of Xdoor, and that's, it's that's now. Amazing. But I'm really what I'm really proud of, it's now in 26 different countries. The okay. the manual people can purchase, and it, the manual itself is it's like a uh, it's like a course on on disc. Well, it's, it's everything's digital now. Yeah. So they have the manual and they have uh, the instructional video that go hand in hand, and it's in 26 different countries around the world. So, cool. um, and, and we're making differences, and and, yeah, and that's the big thing is that we're able to help people, and so I'm really happy that this is. Uh, that this is kind of manifested itself. Yeah, that that that's amazing. So, where what would you suggest for someone's 
that is not familiar with the work and just starting out, what would you suggest for them to, to get first the, the XOR system or the motor point manual? Where, where would a, a, a fresh graduate or a new practitioner, what, what, would, what would your suggestion be? It, well, I, I mean, if you're a fresh graduate, then you're green in all respects, you know, mm. on the assessment side, you know, the needling side, the motor point side. Um, essentially getting both would okay. what would help them but at the, but at the very I, I would say if I just choose I would say going with the motor point manual first because at least with the motor point manual you can help start to sharpen your skills okay. and uh, with the X door system you're basically you're taking an assessment uh, you're, you're learning the assessment system which you can apply but then if you don't have worked on the skills to deliver the goods in terms of the, the tools, then you may be lacking there. So if you sharpen your skills with the needling first and then get the X-Door system, then you can put it all together and you can you know, con uh, see consistent results on a regular basis. Oh, that's it's available in a package where all uh, both of them are available together. And so that's what people kind of do. And then I'm always available for questions. You probably know that, too. So if someone gets it and, yeah. and has a question, they can email me. And, I'm, uh, you know, it's all part of of, uh, of the um, the benefits of, of being part of the, of the system. Oh, yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah. I'm glad I asked you that because I was like I was going to do the opposite. I was going to do the assessment first and then go to motor points. But it's good if I think for a fresh graduate it's good to get get your hands down and dirty get used to palpation location testing them out um, you mentioned I think so yeah hmm, um, you mentioned business briefly and I, I just wanted to pick your brains on what Cairo school was like because um, I, at the point of this for me doing this podcast was just to help other accus out there because it's it's kind of a struggling industry I, I feel almost as if we're like the little cousin or the little brother to Cairo um, you know where where Cairo's went through all this um, drama in the 60s and 70s when they when the MD tried to get rid of Cairo's I, f I feel like the you know the the Western society just isn't really convinced on acupuncture yet and it's always you always we're always fighting this uphill battle this underdog thing and I wanted to pick your brain about um, the business model uh, that was taught in Cairo school what was that like it, it was non yeah it was non-existent okay. yeah it was okay. uh, it was a course we went to once a week uh, that uh, it was non-existent and, and I've written about it in one of the many articles that I write specifically in Canadian chiropractor and chiropractic economics uh -huh. I uh, respectfully call out the chiropractic profession the schools the presidents uh, for their lack of uh, a business acumen that they pass on to the students and it's one reason why that a lot of chiropractors, are not doing well in business. And when I mean a lot, I mean like at least 33% of them are uh, essentially failing uh, from a business perspective. The good news is though, the more recent surveys show that things are getting a little bit better than last year, but still there's there's a long way to go. And I think the uh, down, um, the, the disconnect is not just with chiropractic schools in terms of business or acupuncture schools, but it also happens in business schools as well. Right. Uh, many M MBA programs, uh, if you read historically Stanford in 2005, they had many of their graduates who were unemployed. A and, and so how is this a business school and having their graduates being unemployed? So it happens even in dentistry and all uh, you know in other professions. So I think... With what you were saying, I think with acupuncture specifically, lately I've been in a lot of social media groups and interacting. There's a lot of there's a lot more promise with acupuncturists. I mean, traditional acupuncturists coming from acupuncture schools, the promise and the potential is much more. Uh, the prospects are much brighter than for chiropractors. Oh, you think? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, it is because chiropractors, especially the ones that just manipulate. Manipulation helps people get better. Get, don't get me wrong, but if someone just used manipulation, it's going to take a lot longer to see results than by mm -hmm. using an acupuncture needle. Like someone who has a low back strain might go to a chiropractor 12, 14 visits when using acupuncture and soft tissue work, two or three visits. And so the public's going to catch on and, you know, just like anything else, that service is better. And, yeah, you know, people are, are going to be yeah. paying for a service and you're providing value. The only thing that I think limits chiro uh, acupuncturists is that there's much, many more schools, many mm. more acupuncture schools producing more acupuncturists. So, and, and you may be able to speak to this more than me. I think the 
markets in some areas might be saturated because not a lot of people use acupuncturists like from the general population, the percentage, right. and there's a lot of people there. So is that a limiting factor? Maybe, but again, it's results oriented. If, if right. we can get that niche of acupuncturists getting outstanding clinical results, people will come visit you from everywhere because if people are in pain, all they want is, is results. Yeah, that, that's that's pretty much it. Um, so you've been able to put your out, put yourself out there really, really well. You've got YouTube videos, you've got social media channels, um, you've got this great video DVD series. How did that? What did that? Where does that come from? Like, where do you? Because it's you're such a you know you're so charismatic and great on camera. It's like I, I had a look at the videos, like oh the bow tie, the hair, the beard. He knows what he's talking about. I'm sold. Like I'm just gonna watch this. Like where did that? You know, like how does that? Was that something that developed over time, or were you just you being you, or how how did you develop that? I, I think all of the above. I, you know, definitely that's part of my personality. Uh, the bow tie, I have to admit, is my wife. You know, okay. five years ago <laughs> or six years ago, she said, "I think you should wear bow ties," and I, and I said something like, "Oh, that's ridiculous. I'm not gonna wear a bow tie." And so I, uh, you know, because she bought it for me, I wore it to work one day, and people liked it. And I, that just snowballs from there. I have about 70 different bow ties now. Oh, that's and, awesome. uh, and they're all you uh, self ties, so which is, is a bit of a, a skill to, to get used to. But, you know, uh, I was at a chiropractic uh, conference uh, speaking to new grads about two or three years ago. And I said, this, the big thing is, the important thing is to be yourself. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes people say, well, if I have crazy hair and a bow tie – or this or that, you know, people won't take me seriously, or, you know, if I have earrings or tattoos or whatever it is, you know, people think they need to be the straight and narrow. And, you know, that's fine if that's what you want to do, but be yourself Mm. and be true to yourself. Because if you're yourself, again, people are not going to judge you, especially, you know, people are going to judge all the time. But if you're getting outstanding, if you're giving them the results, right. you, know, you could come dressed up as a clown and they're not <laughs> going to care. You know, you could, you know, come dressed up, you know, in, in whatever, you know, as Batman. And they're going to, you know, they're going to say, great. Yeah. You know, and uh, so, you know, in fact, I even bring my dog to work. I have a little toy That's poodle. Awesome. So picture me going to work with like a little 10 pound poodle under my arm. Uh, definitely not traditional. But it, it just manifested itself like that. In fact, now if I don't wear a bow tie to work, which now I always have to because the patients will be like, Doc, what's going on what's with going the, bow, on? Yeah, the yeah. bow tie? You know, you know. And so, you know, or if I'm in the grocery store, people are like, hey, where's your bow tie? I'm like, wow, well, you know, I'm just, you know, with jogging pants and a T-shirt. But yeah, yeah. so it's it definitely become a trademark. And so uh, that's awesome. So I, ma- I made sure I put it on uh, uh, for us today. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate the effort. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you also about just um, overcoming fear, because I, I think it's always such a uh, for me, every time I put out a video or before I speak to something, even a camera, I know the camera's not going to come back and bite me, poke me in the eye but it's always like oh i'm nervous and there's also all these voices in your head before you put something out there like oh i didn't say that right or um i i I didn't i don't look right today or i'm too skinny or i'm too fat like there's a lot of people out there and i think uh especially in our type of profession unless you put yourself out there because there are no jobs there are no big companies that no, no hospital jobs um how do you overcome that fear how do you what do you say to yourself do you still have that fear even after 14 years do you do you say oh uh, i'm a little nervous or do you just it's just how did how do you overcome that um that's a very it's a very good question i had one when i was in chiropractic college it was a chiropractor named dr chris good and he taught us patient uh communication class it was about halfway through the program and uh in fact i wrote an article about this uh not that long ago and he actually was fantastic. He is fantastic, but he was even more fantastic because what he gave us was it was called the Hot 100 Questions. And what it is is 100 questions that most commonly asked questions that people will ask you about, in this case, chiropractic. And what he made us do is become proficient within a reflex reaction. If someone asked, oh, I heard chiropractic is bad for you, or if you go once, you have to go all the time, reflex answer and you give them an answer or you know oh does chiropractic work for a carpal tunnel and so on and so forth and so i developed in fact this same 100 questions because you can sub in chiropractic for acupuncture or any other discipline and so i did this and the more you practice 
the more you get comfortable with those reflex answers. So that's one thing is being prepared, being armed, even if you're shy. Because if you're not prepared and you're shy, then you're going to kind of go into a, a shell and say, well, you know, I'm not sure. And then people can say, well, you know, that person doesn't really know their stuff or or they're going to form opinions about that person or, or the profession. So the key would be to just talk as much as possible, you know, talk to people, um, even uh, if you're in school getting part time jobs where you're doing retail or working with the public. That's I even I even recommend kids when I say kids high school uh, age mm-hmm. now get jobs even if it's paying minimum wage in a shoe store uh, right. at McDonald's at whatever because keep practicing and because that's how you develop that uh, break out of the shell of a, being a little timid or being a little shy, uh, shy but really practicing speaking to uh, to everyone with myself it, it was easier uh, in terms of. Even as you know, nine, ten years old, I was in public speaking. Oh, okay. My parents had me in public speaking, and so again, I delivered, and then I won a lot too, which was good. So, and then you get to speak more and more and more. So, but even though the, I speak a lot, you still get nervous. Like even for this podcast, I was a bit nervous, but in a good way, right? Yes. Because if what happens if you're not a bit nervous, then you really start making mistakes. Because then you start taking it for granted. I've been on, you know, I remember presentations like in high school, or university. Oh, this is simple. And I would get up there and it would totally bomb because I just thought I was better right. than I was. Right. You have to put the time in and you have to review and like the questions that you sent me, I, you know, made sure I reviewed them. And, you know, yeah. you the key is preparation. And I think that's what echoes even from Dr. Good's lectures. The key is preparation. Be prepared to answer the questions that are going to be fired at you. Yeah. In fact, if anyone, any of your viewers want the list of questions, to just email me cool. at uh, xstore at usa dot com. I offered it the same when I wrote the article. I said if you want these questions, I, I talked to Doctor Good. He okayed it. Um, xstore at usa dot com. I'll send you a copy of the hundred questions. You can just sub in acupuncture, you know, chiropractic, wherever chiropractic is, put acupuncture because mm-hmm. you're going to get the same questions. So many, how many people ask you? Can acupuncture help carpal tunnel? Can yep. acupuncture help migraines? Yeah. And you give them that answer. Yeah. Or, or I'm sure if they say, oh, I heard acupuncture hurts a lot. Yeah. And of course, you'd give them the answer that, you know, that's definitely not true. Yeah. Um, so would you say the same rules apply for, say, when you're trying to promote yourself on social media, on a YouTube channel or an Instagram post? Um, would the same rules apply? Just you got to pound it out, put in the hours, make the mistakes. Yeah. You know, I make a lot of mistakes in my uh in my videos in YouTube where I might say the wrong thing and then correct myself. You know, as long as the final product, you've corrected yourself. Like if I'm pointing to the the ulnar nerve and I say this is the, 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 the radial, radial nerve, nerve yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't and I post it and I don't correct it, well that's just gonna make me look like I don't know what I'm talking about. But in the the, the clip if I say oh this is the radial nerve, oh excuse me, sorry, this is the ulnar nerve, I correct myself, that's fine. You know, people you know, I it's um I don't think it's that big a deal. It shows that you're human, at right. the very least. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, at least, I think most people out there always have this voice in your head, like, "Oh, you're not good enough," or "Or you did this wrong, you did that wrong." And it's always this constant battle, constant struggle, and I just it, it's refreshing to know someone like yourself. You have the same, you know, process, and and you know, you're human as well. And it, it I think, it inspires other people. Yeah, and the thing is, what I notice is that. If you think you've made mistakes or if you think, you know, oh, I don't like the way my hair looked or, or geez, I don't like the way my voice sounded, you know, guess what? Nobody cares. <laughs> You're the yeah, only yeah. one that cares. They, they yeah. really don't. Yeah. You know, they're like, how do you look? Well, you look fine because you know, you're most critical of yourself. And that's right. – so that's what I always say is, you know, like people wouldn't even notice like – you know, yeah. in some instances, you know, I, I could be wearing a football helmet <laughs> during my <laughs> demonstration and like half yeah. the people would say he was wearing a football helmet. I didn't even know. You know so little minor things like, you know, your hair being in a place or, you know, a, a pimple or a blemish. No one's going to notice. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to switch gears a minute and just wanted to pick your brain about networking. So you've worked with so many sports teams, NFL, NHL, National Lacrosse, Cycling, Finland. You've been to Finland. You've been to so many other places in the world. How do you how do you connect with an athlete or a, an influencer, or someone that can really just uh, you know be that tipping point for your practice for, for sports? Do you start one step at a time or do you just start reaching out to people? 
Great question. Exactly. You start one step at a time. You know, when I started in 2003, the first sports uh, gig that I had, I was the chiropractor for a team called the Hamilton Screaming Eagles. And the Hamilton Screaming Eagles was a semi-pro uh, American football team in the North American Football League. And um, I went, you know, their practices a couple times a week. And there were a lot of guys who some played college football, some had brief stints in the CFL or a cup of coffee in the NFL and things like that. And you start from there. And then I would, you know, uh, with this similar, um, you know, semi-pro baseball leagues and things like that. And then what happens when I was taking a lot of courses at McMaster and when I was teaching, a lot of the students, you know, you network. Or even when you take courses, you're going to meet more people, more people, more people. <clears throat> me. And what happened was one of the people that I taught had a uh, a football player that got traded to the pro team in Hamilton that would be the the Canadian see a Canadian version of the NFL and he said there's this chiropractor there Anthony Lombardi go see him so he came to see me and then he then told other teammates who told other teammates and told other teammates yeah and then you know some players get traded and they tell other guys oh you're in Hamilton look go talk to this guy and then a lot, a few of these guys, which was really proud for me, made it into the NFL. So they would play three, four years with the New York Jets or the uh, New York Giants. And so then you start to develop a reputation that you're treating athletes. And the real payoff, so to speak, not that I want to talk, you know, in terms of business, but the payoff is that all the amateur athletes in my practice, the parents of the kids in high school and yeah. minor hockey and so on That's and so awesome. forth, they see this. They see the testimonials yep. on the wall. They see the athletes coming in and they say, wow, he knows what he's doing. And then, of course, I help their son or daughter and they get results. And that's how it starts. One key, if you're treating any athlete, I don't care if it's mm. just a college or amateur, get yep. uh, testimonials, get pictures where they can sign yeah. and, and put them up on the wall. Okay, okay. Um, I think for some of the Australian yeah. listeners, I don't know like how Canada, USA, you can put testimonies in Australia. Um, <clears throat> testimonies aren't allowed, but I think that would be awesome just to have a photo and a signature. I mean, that, yeah. that's, that's great. Um, yeah, I'm sure a photo and a signature. Yeah. There's actually a, a, a kicker in the CFL right now who played uh, Aussie Rules football in Australia. His name's Josh Bartell, and he's been playing in the CFL. He played in Hamilton, now he plays uh -huh. in Saskatchewan, and... Uh, He's he's uh, he, he's a great kicker and uh, he's been here for about five years. So maybe some people listening to this would recall him yeah. uh, as as an athlete in Australia. But but anything you can do, you know, yeah. to you know, obviously working within the rules, course, uh, yeah. getting testimonials and just getting the word out there that you can um, good, help yeah. others. Yeah. I, I know here what's happened with a lot of associations like the physical therapists here in Canada have limitations in terms of testimonials, but you can't stop anyone. For instance, Bob, if you came to see me and then you decided, wow, I really like Anthony Lombardi. Right. I'm going to write a great review on Google yep. about him. They yep. can't stop you from doing that. Yep. And now that's out there, yep. right? So that's something that you can encourage your patients to do or say, you know, hey, you know, if you feel, you know, if they feel like doing it, there's no law against that. Yep. Um Anywhere, to my knowledge, no one can stop me from doing a good review. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, no, probably so. not. Yeah, it's, it's it's a world full of red tape, but then it, it is what it is. You just got to roll with the right. punches. So, um, so when we are when you're trying to connect with that first sports athlete, would you would you suggest emailing, cold calling, trying to make a connection of some sort? Just that. Yeah. Uh... That's a good question. I, I, no, I wouldn't email or cold call. I, I would let it happen on its own. You okay. know, from from meeting different people. You know, going to a lot of events, uh, whether they're um, uh, events like athletic events or fundraisers, and just meet people because eventually that connection is going to be made. That someone's going to say, "Hey, uh, you, you, have you met so and so, this athlete or that athlete?" And here's the other thing too that people don't actually realize that treating athletes isn't as glamorous as it sounds and it's no. not as profitable no. as it sounds no. it's not, <laughs> not. <laughs> so try not to get hung up on that i remember i yeah. said oh i want to do this and now i'm treating them now and now you know for 90 percent of my practice isn't 90 80 percent of my practice is regular people okay yeah. and 
but you know the athletes sometimes can become a little bit more cumbersome that they they expect a little bit more in terms of you know more time because here a lot of these players will say football they've been babied you know they've been like the guy mm. or or the girl throughout college right and they've been taken care of and now the pros they accept, expect that same type of treatment which you try to give them but you know you can give them only you know you only have so much time right and, right. and you're busy so so you know only pursue it if you're really something that you want to do otherwise your yeah. time's better well spent just networking to get regular people because regular people will from a business standpoint make you very very busy and and very content financially yeah that's that's really practical advice that that's absolutely yeah that, that i find athletes as well it's you fix it they break it again you fix it you break it again they're always on that 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 treadmill i'm like mm, i don't know what we're getting done here <laughs> but um so actually there, there was this, there's also this this in the acu uh schools and and a little bit you know a few practitioners i know as well there's always this guilt about accepting money for your services as well and it's it, it's um do, do do chiros have that problem as well and if so how 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 do you overcome that that mindset because at the end of the day it, it is a business um you're here if you even if you shut down then you're no good to anybody so what what would you say is the uh, the key thing what was that moment where you're like well i got to turn this into a business otherwise you know it, it's i can't help anybody that's a good question because I think a lot of graduates have that when they first start. Um, you know, you understand that, of course, you're running a business and you have bills and, you know, you need to set fees. I remember the first time I received uh, in the mail checks from insurance companies that say it was treating a, a worker's injury or auto. And I remember looking at it like, oh, my God, they're paying me to do this. Yeah. Like, yeah. wow. This is, this crazy. is that, You know, and it was like, <laughs> wow. It's like almost like you made it. But – you know, and b because I think a lot of times the people that have the problem accept accepting the money are the people that are very passionate, that really, really want to help people. And they don't want to be skewed by the dollar sign. But again, people, you want to have the patients that value your services, okay? And if you have patients that value what you do, they will be happy to pay a fair price for what you're giving them. So don't feel bad about that. You know, feel bad if you think you're charging way more than you think you should be charging and people are paying. You know, charge just enough that the market can handle. But more importantly, charge enough that you can sleep at night. And, you know, and if that amount is really, really low, then charge with the with the average is. Because it's, if everyone's charging, I'm making up a number, $50 for a visit, then it's okay for you to charge $50. Yeah. And the big thing is, you know, are you striving to get quality results when you're providing the treatment? Right. And are you giving them great value for the $50? And so that's the main thing. With acupuncture, the benefit that acupuncturists have, in my opinion, is that the treatment takes time. There's no way you can just, like, throw needles in and, and then take them out. Okay, after a minute, you're done. No. It's um, expected that the treatment is X amount of time, 15, 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is. So people will pay because it's perceived, you know, we're going to get a value versus the problem a lot of chiropractors have and continue to have is that they may charge $50 for the adjustment and the adjustment takes literally two minutes. They're like, okay, uh, see you later. See. Yeah. So how does, you know, and people value are money. not, people, people are smart nowadays. You know, they're more educated, I believe, than let's say 30, 40 years ago. They're like, wait a minute. I just give you fifty dollars for a two-minute adjustment, versus someone who spends fifteen or twenty minutes with them, the soft tissue, things like that. They're going to perceive that as the better treatment. So give value. Um, don't feel bad about it if your intentions are good, and you'll do fine. Wow, that's that's yep. Couldn't said it better myself, uh, Dr. Lombardi. Uh, one last question before we, we finish up. Um, if you had to start over again, say it was an alternative life, like, what would you do? If it wasn't this, what would you what would you do? He, I'm telling you, I just was talking to someone about this. Uh, so it'd be one of two things. It would be either a hairstylist, okay? <laughs> and and the reason for that is because the hairstylist and a chiropractic or acupuncture business have the same business model. And it's really good because a hairstylist 
is let's say it's me i'm the hairstylist i can hire two or three or four associates rent them a chair make a percentage off of what they're billing i can also have an esthetician over here just like let's say maybe a massage therapist or i can have uh, a makeup artist over there or even a massage therapist as well some uh, hair salons so there's there are, are many revenue streams and uh overhead is probably about the same and the business has to come in every month because most people uh, most people have hair and most people who do yeah. have hair, it grows and they're going to have to get it cut or treated or styled every month or so. So it's even better than acupuncturists or chiropractors because people don't have to come in every month. You know, most time it's just when they're injured. So you, you know, that yeah. would probably be the, the best approach. In, in fact, you no, know, I'm not going to stop what I'm doing and do that, but it's really exciting. People who have salons and that, because everyone uses them at, in in some yep. way. The, the second thing is I, is I probably would be a lawyer. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would probably be a lawyer because uh, you know again I enjoy speaking and I enjoy you know even now I'm I'm writing politicians on things you know emailing things and that you know questioning things um, and uh, and it's something that I could see myself doing. Uh, probably not a politician. Because with politicians, you have to be a little bit more tactful. You can't really, you know, I would probably alienate a lot of voters with, you know, <laughs> you know, you have to kind of run a balance. I'm like, no, that's wrong, you know. But, uh, you know, probably hairstylist. If I had to pick hairstylist, one. Hairstylist, that's awesome. We'll be a hairstylist, yeah. We're in a salon and, yeah. Dr. Lombardi, thank you again so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, where can we find you? What, what, what is the best email address to locate you at if we want to find you directly? The, yeah, it's xstore. E-X-S-T-O-R-E at U-S-A dot com. Dr. Lombardi, thank you very much. I'll be in touch. Talk to you soon. All right. I appreciate it. Have a good, have a good, great year. All right.